911 is universally known throughout the United States. Children are taught from as young as they have the capacity to understand that if they need help, that's the number to call. But although there are more than 240 million calls to the operators on the other end of the phone every single year, this system has not been quite as ubiquitous as it seems. The need for a way to communicate the need for emergency professionals has been recognized for centuries, but from fire watchers with bells to clunky ways to hijack telephone wires, the technology that got us to this point had an incredibly rocky road leading to its 1968 debut. So how did 911 come to be, and how did they choose what number it should be? Stick around and find out as we learn something new. There's more to emergency service calls than just reporting crimes, as one of the first instances of emergency service notification technological development came from the need to report fires. Throughout the 1800s, America was struggling with fire hazards, and a need for a speedy fire response was evident. To mitigate the risk of fire spreading, some cities had watchmen that would yell through the streets whenever they saw smoke on the skyline. They were reliant on those who might hear them to move quickly to the fire and help put it out any way they can because they knew just how devastating a fire left unrestrained could be. Like the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 that claimed the lives of 300 people in the homes of tens of thousands of others. In 1828, the local government of Philadelphia tried to implement a better solution, installing a bell at the top of Independence Hall with a watchman that could ring it to direct people to the fire using bell codes, ringing the bell at different intervals to indicate if the fire was north, south, east, or west. Other cities like New York and Boston were quick to follow with this method, but by the turn of the century, American cities spurred on by the Industrial Revolution were growing so rapidly in size and population that it was clear a more high-tech solution was needed to pinpoint the source of a fire. William F. Channing and Moses Farmer were two men in the Boston area that were both obsessed with the potential for telegraphy. Specifically, both believed it could be harnessed to create a reliable and near-instantaneous fire alarm system throughout the city of Boston. Austin. The two men collaborated to lobby city officials to fund their new emergency response system and ended up receiving $10,000 to develop and establish their network. After running nearly 50 miles of wire throughout the city, connected to dozens of alarm boxes and bells, Channing and Farmer's system was ready in the spring of 1852. If someone opened an alarm box and turned a small crank, the special purpose telegraph would send out a pulsating electric current to electromagnets that pulled and released the bell clappers, producing alarms at both the scene of the emergency and at the central station, where the location was then recorded. The first attempt by the public to use this system was on April 29, 1852. Unfortunately, on the day of the first emergency, the man who spotted the fire spun the crank too fast, and the message wasn't able to be picked up. The man ended up having to run to the central signal office to alert them of the fire in person. Nevertheless, Channing and Farmer would continue to refine their system, and within months, it proved a reliable tool in raising the alarm in Boston. They would eventually get patent number 17,355 on May 19, 1857. But we were still far from an ideal system, even as their models spread from Boston to New Orleans, St. Louis to Philadelphia. As the 1900s began, the use of the new telephone was spreading across the world, and with it came new ways of alerting emergency services to fires, crimes, and medical emergencies. But in the UK, the world's oldest emergency call telephone service would only be started after tragedy struck. On November 10, 1935, there was a house fire in London that led to the deaths of five women trapped inside. What made it so much worse was that a neighbor down the street saw the fire start and immediately tried to call the fire department, but was put into the back of a waiting queue by an operator and spent precious minutes waiting to have his call routed. He was so furious at the deaths and essentially being put on hold for an emergency that he wrote a letter to the editor of a local newspaper, which then prompted a government inquiry into the matter. Their response touted a 12-mile radius around Oxford Circus, and the public were told to only call if there was an ongoing emergency, like the man in the flat next to yours murdering his wife. The first arrest from the system occurred just one week after it was implemented, but as they began installing the system into payphones, which had been invented just 12 years earlier, they needed to find a way around the coin-operated design so that people didn't need to pay to call the police. They were able to most easily modify the payphones to allow for use of the 9 
nine digit on the rotary dial, and 999 was chosen because if someone was at home in the dark or trapped in dense smoke, 999 could easily be dialed by placing one finger, one hold from the dial stop on the phone, and just rotating the dial to its full extent three times. 111, on the other hand, was avoided because they were worried it might be too easy to accidentally dial, given how little movement was needed to actually make the dial. In fact, sometimes transmission wires of the time could accidentally make contact and produce an electrical pulse similar to dialing a 1, setting off the emergency line without a person ever touching the phone. The system worked well in areas that it was implemented, but its installation across the UK would be delayed with the start of World War II. Meanwhile, in the US, there wouldn't be any emergency call services for decades after the UK, though there had been some attempts, like the Ericsson Communication Company in the early 1900s, which developed a portable phone that could be attached to any telephone wires. Once it was, a hand crate could be used to create a signal through the wire. Unfortunately, this method required someone to be carrying the box with them when they saw the emergency, needing to have an accessible telephone wire nearby, and if everything else was working, they needed someone to happen to be listening on the line that was in a position to send help. Despite the many flaws with the system, the Industry Council on Emergency Response Technologies claimed that it was actually used successfully to report a train robbery in 1907. Any further advancements in the United States would be a long way off, however, as calls for a national emergency number didn't really start until 1957. It was in 1957 that the National Association of Fire Chiefs thought that having a single consistent number dedicated to emergencies would make it easier for people to report fires. Sure, at that time, people could already report emergencies to fire departments or police stations, but it wasn't easy. Either they needed to dial the seven-digit phone number of the police station, which changed depending on where you were at and who you were calling, or they needed to dial zero for an operator to direct their call for them. But it would take another 10 years before President Lyndon B. Johnson would have a commission issue a report recommending that citizens should have the ability to contact any police department with one consistent phone number. AT&T, who was a telecommunications behemoth at the time, operating nearly every phone connection in the United States, established the 911 line less than a year later. The number was chosen with similar logic to the British. The rotary dial meant that dialing a 9 would make it less likely for misdials to come through, but after the first digit was dialed, dialing 1 was the quickest number able to be dialed, thus settling on 911. On February 16th, 1968, the very first call was made in Haleyville, Alabama by the Speaker of the House, Rangan Fight. This came from the mayor's office, but on the other end of the demonstration, and in fact in the same building, was Congressman Tom Bevel, who answered the call. Yet despite the clear benefits of the system, the government didn't institute a widespread rollout of the number, leading to a remarkably slow adoption of the rather important life-saving development. Incredibly, 20 years later, only half of the United States population had access to 911. And by the close of the 1900s, it was up to 90%. It wasn't until the Public Safety Act of 1999 that 911 was officially established as the United States Emergency Calling Number. Today, more than 240 million calls a year are made to 911. That's over 600,000 calls every single day. And it's hard to calculate just how many lives have been saved from its adoption. Now, over 80% of these calls come from cell phones. Society went from people needing to physically run to others to ask for help in an emergency, to having nearly everyone in the country carrying a near instantaneous connection to emergency services. It's something often overlooked in its importance, never really realizing just how important it is until it's you that needs to dial. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe for more. Thanks again to everyone who helped get this channel to 10,000 subscribers. I could not have done it without you, and I'm so excited to see where this channel goes from here.